Hello, my name is Antonina Piralski. I'm a university assistant at the Department of Innovation and Digitalization in Law. And today we're going to again talk about data protection law. Today our main focus would be on rights of data subjects as defined in the GDPR. As you can see on the slide, the rights of data subjects are defined in Articles 12 to 22 of the GDPR. But do not forget Article 23. Why is this important? Because Article 23 of the GDPR defines how and when these rights could be limited. Another important thing here is that since the GDPR is obviously a regulation, all of these rights are directly applicable. What does it mean? If you're going to look at the GDPR and find some rights that, for example, might help you solve a specific situation in which you currently are, you can use them in front of, for example, in the court or some other public body to help you resolve your situation. One small remark only. Today we're going to only focus on some chosen rights. We're not going to talk about all of them. In more detail, we're going to talk about it in the lecture. The first one I would like to focus on is Article 12 GDPR. It is a, actually a prerequisite of exercising all of the other rights. Why is that? Because it defines how every communication between a data subject and a controller or a processor should be conducted. It establishes some minimum standards on how the controller should behave in order to accommodate data subjects' requests. As you can see here, for example, the controller has the duty of providing information in concise, transparent, intelligible and easily accessible form using clear and plain language. So that's a very important provision in the GDPR because it forces the controllers to give you all of the information you might need in such a form that you will understand it even without any legal background. The Article 12 of the GDPR also sets out a minimum time of reaction of the controller every time you're going to lodge a request. So, as you can see here, the controller should react without undue delay within the maximum time of one month. As in most of the cases, there is an exception to that. There is possible to extend this term, but the possible extension is also defined by the GDPR. Every information that would be provided to you by the controller should be free of charge. As always, again, there are some exceptions to this rule, although very narrow. The next right I would like to talk about is the right of access by the data subject. It is defined in Article 15 GDPR. It is quite different from what you might find in Articles 12 to 14. Why is that? Because Articles 12 to 14 they put a duty on the controller to act in a specific way. So, in Articles 12 to 14, the active party is the controller. Here, in Article 15, everything starts with a request from the data subject to the controller. It is very simple, really. Every data subject has a right to ask a controller if his or her personal data is being processed. And then, if yes, there is a list of additional information that the controller needs to provide. For example, regarding purpose of processing, categories of data that are being processed, recipients of data, and so on and so on. Another thing is that if personal data is being processed by the controller, then also within the scope of Article 15, data subject has a right to request a copy 
of process data so that he or she will not only receive information on what and how is being processed, but can actually see the personal data that the controller stores. Next right is the right to erasure or so-called right to be forgotten as defined in Article 17 GDPR. Here, the first important thing is that contrary, for example, to Article 15, it's not only data subjects' right. It is also an independent duty of the controller. Practically speaking, it means that if the requirements for erasure of data that are set out in Article 17 are met, the controller cannot wait for a request from the data subject to erase this data. It has an independent duty to do this on its own as soon as the requirements are met. So that is something different from Article 15 and that is a construction that not only can be found in Article 17, but also sometimes in different provisions in the GDPR. So please watch out for that. Here you can find a list of situations in which the right to erasure or the duty to erasure would find place. For example, the first one, when the data is no longer necessary for the original purpose. A very good example of that is the recruitment process. If you're going to apply for a job and you will not get that job, then as soon as the recruitment process is over, the controller, in this case your potential employer, has the duty to delete your data as soon as someone else would be hired for the position. Also, another example in the second line, withdrawal of consent and lack of any other legal basis for processing. If the processing would be based on a consent that you give for, for it, and you're going to withdraw this consent, and there are no other legal basis for processing your personal data, then the controller has the duty to erase it. One interesting thing, here at the very bottom of the slide, if data is stored on a rewritable drive, that would be a standard hard drive that can be found in any computer, then data is not erased once it will be just deleted by the controller. It would be only erased then when the hard drive would be rewritten with new data. There is also a second part of the right to erasure or the so-called right to be forgotten that is defined in paragraph 2 of Article 17. That is the duty of the controller to notify other controllers who are always for also processing or storing uh, personal data of a data subject, that the data subject has filed a request for erasure. It is commonly believed to be this pure right to be forgotten that would allow everyone to just dis disappear from the internet, but it does not work like that. As, for example, in the case of anonymization of personal data, there is the threshold of what is reasonable, right? So if you're going to look here, you'll find that the controller has only duty to, do, to, to make reasonable steps taking account of available technology and the cost of implementation. So it does not have, the controller does not have an absolute duty to find every other controller who is processing personal data. He only has to take reasonable steps in this direction. There are obviously also some exceptions from this rule, as you can find on the slide. The most vital one would be protection of the right of freedom of expression and information. Mm, another very interesting right that can be found in the GDPR is the right to data portability. It's a new right. It was absent in the old data protection directive. Right now it's an Article 20. It grants to the data subjects right to receive their personal data from the controller in a structured, commonly used and machine-readable format and then to transmit those data to another controller 
What, what, what's the purpose of this provision? Well, it should allow you not to be forced to use one specific service on the internet. Like take, for example, social media. If you will find a different social media service that would offer you better conditions or that would more respect your privacy than the original in which you're actually, particip actually participating, then according to Article 20, you have the right to grab all the data that they have about you and take it to a different controller. Uh, there is obviously a problem of monopolies in this case. If, for example, again, in the area of social media, if there, there is one big monopoly and there are no competitors, this right remains on paper because you have nowhere to take your data to. The last provision of the GDPR I would like to talk to you about today is Article 22. It is framed as a right of the data subject not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling. If you look at the definition, you'll find in bold crucial three elements of it. So, first of all, for this right to apply, processing of personal data has to be solely based on automated processing. It means that if there is absolutely only if there is absolutely no human involvement in processing personal data, then this provision would apply. That's the first element. Second element, legal effects. If decision-making and this automated decision-making process produces legal effects concerning a data subject, only then Article 22 would apply. If that would not be a legal effect, there is also another option, how to be protected by Article 22. That is similarly significant effects. And what does it all mean? Well, take an example of a mortgage or a credit. You want to get a credit from a bank. And the bank will not use people to decide how high your interest should be but rather an automated decision-making system. It will analyze your data and then provide the bank with a suggested interest for you and for your credit. In this case, if there is absolutely no human involvement in the whole process, which rarely takes place, but if there would be no human involvement, then you would have the right not to be subject to this decision. But Obviously, there is a very simple way how to circumvent Article 22, which is being employed by many controllers. That is, they have automated systems that give them, for example, a risk analysis or credit risk analysis. And then on the top of that is one single person that theoretically makes the decision. It's then a very interesting legal question whether or not Article 22 would apply, but keep it in mind that it's not so easy to exercise this right as defined in Article 22. And that will be all. Thank you for your attention.